Were there really doctrinal changes in the 1830 Book of Mormon? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. We're continuing our discussion with Danny. Boy, this has been exciting. It has been and, fun. Uh, yeah, fun. And again, we're not going into detail in these topics, but these are some of the things that affected us as both of us were longtime members of the church, and they kind of affected us in different ways of coming out of the church, things we learned and had no idea about some of them. That's so, true. That's true. But before we continue, you actually, um, we were going to have you, I guess, uh, put on our on our screen here, um, you're talking to Mormons dot, dot or, org. Dot, no, talking to Mormons dot com. Dot com. Yeah. But part of that you do is also something called Come Follow Me. Would you explain a little bit about sure. what that is? Yeah. Uh, the LDS Church has began a program come, ca called Come Follow Me, which each year they study a different one of their scriptures. Last year, this year, in 2019, they studied the New Testament. Yeah. And next year they'll be studying the Book of Mormon. So okay. uh, this past year I have taught lessons in conjunction with the LDS schedule for their Come Follow Me lessons each week and we put it on a podcast for people to look at. And so I'll continue to do that in in 2020. Going through the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm, through the Book of Mormon. And this is on TalkingToMormons.com. Right, they can go there and find and that. And don't you find, don't, uh, what's the most interesting thing you found, I'm, I'm thinking you're going to say this, but about going through the New Testament? Well, what I try to do in when I teach the lessons is that I'm trying to also use what the LDS have taught about those verses. And so I'm showing what the biblical uh, meaning is and uh, intention of the writer is. And I contrast that with what Mormonism has what interpreted actually, it to mean. And what they're actually portraying right. on their pages. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you sense that they cover so much material and they're really over skipping over maybe some of the really what we would know oh, well, as Christians the, think are pretty meaty scriptures. Yeah, oh, definitely. The lessons are very brief. It, you know, they yeah. only uh, they're very brief, and they don't go into the detail. And then when they get to a sticky part in in the scriptures where it might contradict or make make their doctrine look bad, they skip over that. So <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. And kind of interesting though. I guess. It has. Uh, yeah, it's know. been a blessing though to study the Word of God. Yeah. For me. Well, this has been fun, and so we do look at our notes a little bit here because we're covering so many topics, yeah. and I think I've probably overstudied for uh, <laughs> or pr trying to prepare for this. But the next one that we're going to cover is um, grace versus works. And the interesting thing about that is I think it's one of the most important distinctions between biblical Christianity and Mormonism the concept of working and grace. And just so people have a basis here, Second Nephi 25, 23 says, for we know that it is by grace that we're saved after all we can do. And also the third article of faith, which I just never really understood this as a Mormon. Uh, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the law and ordinances of the gospel. You know, it's just so funny. And Marky Peterson in General Conference said, salvation comes through the church. Wow. And Spencer Kimball said in the Miracle of Forgiveness on page 206, I'm sorry these aren't on the screen, one of the most fallacious doctrines originated by Satan mm. and propounded by man is that man is saved alone by the grace of God, that belief in Jesus Christ alone is all that is needed for salvation. That is so sad. A fallacious statement yeah. by a prophet yeah. of God. But I do have a couple of scriptures that are pretty interesting from the Bible. Romans 4, 2, and 5. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans six twenty three says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in John 6, 28, 29, I just love this one. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Pretty neat. Yeah. 
Yeah. It is. Uh -huh. Next topic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to look at the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, and this... Ooh, what a red flag. <laughs> yeah, this will uh, strike home with you because I remember watching you on TV yeah. read your statement about uh, the revelation you received when you read, <laughs> read and compared the 1830 edition yeah. of the Book of Mormon with the current one today and noticing the changes that had been made in the, yeah. in the, the, the Doctrinal text. changes. Yeah. Right? Not periods and ands and buts, no. but they're, they're they're, doctrinal. There are a lot of grammatical changes sure. that have been changed but um, over time, but uh, the doctrinal changes are significant. So I just want to refer to a couple of these, okay? So sure. if we take a look at First Nephi, chapter 11, verse 18, and this is out of the 1830 edition, page 25. It says, Mother, or Mary, Mother of God, and it, that has been changed to... Mary, mother of the Son of God. So we have to realize in these verses that Joseph Smith was thinking uh, from a Protestant background. I think so. That Jesus was God. Yeah. And he believed that when he wrote the Book of Mormon. But later on, when his theology changed to believing in three different gods in the Godhead, yeah. then he had to change this, these verses to, or the, he didn't, but the church later on did to conform. And how that impacted our thinking about, my thinking, about the 1820 experience oh, in yeah. the Sacred Grove. Yeah, yeah there's which, a problem did there. did that really happen if 10 years later we're not saying the same thing? Yeah. So, I think you'll cover that in lectures. On, uh, yeah, probably. Okay. So another verse is First Nephi chapter 11, verse 21, again on page 25 of the 1830 edition. The verse reads in part, Lamb of God, the Eternal Father, to... Lamb of God, Son of the Eternal Father. Yeah. And then 1 Nephi chapter 11, verse 32, on the next page of the Book of Mormon, it states in part, The everlasting God was judged of the world, changed to the Son of the everlasting God was judged of the world. <laughs> and then the last one is in 1 Nephi chapter 13, verse 40, and this would be on page 32 of the 1830 edition. In part, it says, the Lamb of God is the Eternal Father and the Savior of, of the world. To the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father and Savior of the world. So, <laughs> can, uh, you, can you imagine being Joseph Smith, having to make these changes and thinking, oh, am I going to have to go through this whole book and get this right? <laughs> yeah, later on when, yeah. he, when he changes. When he made the changes, he'd have to go through the whole we'll thing. We'll talk about it, but the Book of Mormon really wasn't that significant to Joseph Smith. There was never a sermon that he taught using the Book of Mormon. Never quoted from it. No. Or... I think it was a money-making deal. And when they realized that they weren't going to be profitable, and it was actually costing them money, that yeah. he just sort of put it aside. But well, it... you remember he tried to sell the yeah, copyright. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Will we? Yeah. Okay. okay, sorry. Your turn. <laughs> oh, is that it? Yep. Okay. So the next one is Christian values. You know, it just struck me. I don't know why I'm so naive to think that Mormons had it all. We had families, we had all the things. And when I came out, all of a sudden I learned that Christians actually care for their children. Yeah, and they teach morals. They have youth programs, <laughs> they have adult, they have marriage counseling. I mean, it was just a shock to me, and I, I know that sounds silly and naive, but here we have these wonderful Christian people throughout the country, and as a Mormon, I gave them no respect at all. I just figured it was eat, drink, and be merry. You just yeah, you had no control life. of your family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I didn't even realize that they had the worship that they do. Yeah, and it's because they had the truth. To, and now to go in and and just praising Jesus and and the worship that goes on. Yeah. Who knew that they had Christian values? <laughs> Crazy, but I, I may, I'm thinking maybe there's other Mormons, uh, LDS people oh, that would yeah. feel the same way Definitely. I did. I agree with you, Earl. Next one. Okay, the next one's topic is lying for the Lord. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is acceptable in Mormonism. Did you know that? <laughs> well, I've sensed that, yes. Yeah. So let me just go back to the roots of this because the approval or consent to lying was really established in the Pearl of Great Price. And Joseph Smith wrote in Abraham chapter 2, verses 23 and 25, that God commanded Abraham uh, yeah. while he was in Egypt to lie to protect himself and his wife Sarah from harm. Mm. And so Joseph used that premise in his own life by um, 
lying and privately to, to Emma about him being married to other women and then lying publicly to the church about him having wives. And uh, Yeah, nobody seemed to know that at all, did they? And then the and church... certainly Emma didn't. No, yeah, she didn't right. until later. Um, yeah. And then the church itself lied to the U.S. government and said, we don't practice polygamy. But then when they wanted to apply for statehood, uh, they admitted that they did and they were going to stop the practice and so that's why the manifestos of 1890 and 1904 right. were written. Um, but they continued to lie because even though they signed those manifestos, they lived the law of polygamy and added wives to their families up to 1920. Did they really? Yeah, they oh. did. Uh, even the prophet of the church back then. No, I didn't know that. Joseph F. Smith. I think it was Joseph F. Smith. Or, wow. Um, so just another one, one, one quote that I'd like to, to read. That's from De, uh, Boyd K. Packer, who was an apostle and um, uh, of the church. In 2009, he said, quote, There is a temptation for the writer or the teacher of the church to want to tell everything, whether it is worthy of faith promoting or not. Some things that are true are not very useful. <laughs> so... Um, I just think that lying in itself, God does not lie, and no. He would not want us to lie. And so for a church to have its prophets and apostles lie um, is just not proper and not biblical. Well, one of the things that strikes me with that is what the definition of lying is. It's not actually always just saying a lie. Yeah. It's sometimes not saying what full should truth. be said, full truth. Right half-truth, if you will. Yeah. And we're going to cover a couple yeah. of these. In fact, I think I have the same quote of Boyd K. Packers, oh, but okay. there's a couple of others. But I've noticed that with all kinds of things. And I don't know if you were aware of this, but in uh, uh, President Uchtdorf, in quoting Isaiah 9-6, mm, oh, yeah. he, um, uh, boy, now that I'm talking, I can't remember, but for unto us a child is born, and, mm -hmm. and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name, be wonderful counselor, the mighty God, he leaves out the everlasting Father yeah. from that scripture and finishes it up with Prince of Peace or whatever. Just, it's just interesting that they, he would not feel inclined to say the full scripture right. of Isaiah 9-6. Yeah. And that was in the end sign. Okay, next one, I guess, is our lectures on faith. This was written around 1834, 1835 for what was called the School of the Prophets. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Smith uh, taught them, and I, I you know who else taught them, but they were part of the part of this uh, their lexicon or whatever mm -hmm. for studying at the time. And um, James Talmage speculated. In fact, they were included. There were seven lectures, and they were included in the Doctrine and Covenants until 1921, I think. James Talmage said that he speculated that they were dropped due to possible confusion, <laughs> things that were confusing. Right. And I'd like to read what I read when I was coming through this process of the changes in the Book of Mormon, that 1820, 1830 problem, and then a couple of other things, um, the different versions of the first vision. But then I read, went to lecture five in the lectures of faith, and here's what it says. There are two personages who constitute the great power over all things. They are the Father and the Son, the Father being a personage of spirit, glory, and power. Now, first of all, D&C 130 says that the Father uh, has flesh and bone, right? Not a spirit. So, Father being a personage of spirit, possessing all perfection and fullness, the Son who's in the, in the bosom of the Father, again, that's very Christian, uh, sounding, a personage of tabernacle made or fashioned like unto man. He's also the express image and likeness of the personage of the Father, possessing all the fullness of the Father, or the same fullness with the Father, to be a propitiation for the sins of all those who should believe on His name, and is called the Son because of the flesh, possessing the same mind with the Father, which mind is the Holy Spirit, again very Trinitarian, and these three are one, and these three constitute the Godhead and are one. So when he writes this in 1834, now we're up to, from 1830 to 1834, he still has his concept of a Trinitarian God. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
And I don't know. We have to realize that the first vision hadn't even been released yet to the public. Not the he'd one, not from he'd the written the first. Yeah, yeah, he had written the first, his first vision experience in his own diary in, 18, in 1832. Yeah, right? so yeah. we were close in that and time And again, frame. that was one God, right. one Lord. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So. Okay. All right, so the next topic is apostasy and restoration. And, and apostasy is really the core doctrine of the church. It's, it's important that for it, it a really restoration is, to be made, a total, complete yeah. apostasy had to happen right. back in Christ's day. And so with uh, the death of Jesus and the apostles and the loss of the priesthood, they call it a, a universal apostasy. apostasy. Um, and then we know that Jesus in the Book of Mormon appeared to the people in, in America and set up his church and called his 12 disciples there and established his church there. Um, and yet that apostasy took place on that part of the world. So we have two complete apostasies. So it really makes Jesus look like a complete failure <laughs> in setting up his church and, and uh, so that it would last so through Joseph time. Smith had to come and do what Jesus couldn't do. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, but Christ did promise that heaven and, have, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And so we believe that the gospel was once it says in Jude, Jude chapter 1 verse 3 that the gospel was once uh, delivered unto the saints and that it has remained on the earth ever since yeah. in one form or the other. Yeah. And uh, so, and Jesus also promised that uh, the, to the apostles that his church would be built upon the rock, his, the rock which was Jesus Christ, Jesus. right? And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So. I don't believe that Jesus was lying about that and that he was a failure. I believe that no. the gospel was established back then and that it has been on the earth ever since. So I don't consider the LDS Church to be a restoration. I believe it to be a renovation of oh. things. And so when you look at the HQTV shows like Fixer Up yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. Flip or Flop, you yeah. know, they never go back and restore the, the building that they're working on to be the original. No. They always remodel it and renovate it renovate to look it. like something newer or different. And that's what really good, what the LDS Church has done with their, God, with their uh, organization and their teachings. The one thing that struck me about that coming out uh, about the apostasy was where two or three are gathered in my name, yeah. there am I also. Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as you have Jesus, you don't need anything else. No, and so really. without as long as there were ever two or three people gathered, they had Jesus. That's and, right. And uh, as we know, that's belief. Well, one of the other big things besides, I think, grace and works is this next topic of being born again. And, um, you know, for some people it's a process. For me, it's been more of a process. It wasn't a, I, w I wasn't down on my knees and ready to, you know, kind of end it all kind of a thing right. to become born again. But for me, it's been processional. I don't know what was. Your I agree. It, it, for you? me, it kind of has been that way as as well. But I think the point was is that I'm a new creature. I see things differently. Yeah. You know, I I think of some of the movies that have struck me with that change. Uh, three of them come to mind. But Ben Hur, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He changes his heart. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Banks from Mary Poppins. You know how. Okay, his, I don't remember that one. You know, no. where, well, he he just you know. Yeah. Okay. And the other one's Uncle Scrooge, oh, or not yeah. Scro Uncle Scrooge, but Scrooge. Uh -huh. You know where he, his heart changes. He becomes a new creature. And I think that's the telltale. Well, the interesting thing is, um, where did I put it? Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't the interesting it. thing is you can't find it. Well, here's the, okay. here it is. <laughs> Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 162. He says, being born again comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances. Oh. Ouch. Then I've already quoted the third article of faith about the atonement of Christ. Mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinance of the gospel. Yeah. Joseph Fielding Smith said, through baptism and confirmation, they're born again through continued obedience to the end. And they shall be partakers of the blessing of eternal life in the celestial kingdom of God. I'm kind of paraphrasing Michael Wilcox, but he said the Christian world would lead many to believe that salvation comes through a simple acceptance of Christ as one's personal savior. However, the Book of Mormon reveals the process requires more than accepting Christ. Well, it's in accepting Christ that we become children of God. And well, then we spiritually mature as we learn 
his word. We study his word and we... Uh, as Mormons. As, yeah. as Christians. Oh, as Christians. Yeah. You know. Well, my thinking, thinking is that uh, the wages of sin is death, but mm. the gift of God is eternal life. Yeah. And uh, all the scriptures that tell us that it, eternal life comes about, uh, we've read some of them, right. and through just the belief in Jesus Christ and accepting him what he did, not what we exactly what we do. And I think we know when we you know when you've been regenerated or you've been born again. You that, can tell when somebody calls you, I'll bet. As your heart you? changes, you're just you know you want to love people more. You you are more patient and tolerant and long suffering, and yeah. and you become um, more Christ like perhaps in your dealing with mankind yeah. and with yourself. And yeah. it's a it's a wonderful blessing it's a miracle really yeah how god works some people and hearts. nicodemus he he he's the one that said uh well you know jesus said yeah. you have to be born again he said well can i go back into my mother's womb he understood that it wasn't water baptism no that it was a change of heart and, yeah and the know. spirit of god working in their lives okay okay the next topic is gospel topic essays um we know that because of the internet it has made a huge impact on people knowing and finding out about the true history and doctrine of their church. And so LDS Church has had to face their history and try to present it to the membership in such a way as to explain why they used to teach something different and they had to own up to uh, their doctrine. Yeah. So they began in 2013 through 2015 to release these gospel topic essays on LDS.org, which is now the Church of Jesus Christ.org. And there's 11 of them uh, that have been released, and I'm just going to go through them alphabetically. This is how you'll find them on their website. Are Mormons Christians? Becoming Like God, Book of Mormon and DNA Studies, Book of Mormon Translation, First Vision Accounts, Joseph Smith's Teachings About Priesthood, Temple, and Women, Mother in Heaven, Peace and Violence Among 19th Century Latter-day Saints, Race and the Priesthood, and Translation and Historicity of the Book of Abraham. Now, when these were released, most members don't even know that they exist. Uh, they're, they're starting, they're starting to lot, find out. They don't, they don't know. They're never quoted. They, want, they don't know where they're to find them, and they, I don't think they know what to expect when they read them, but... Those that have, particularly like, for example, the Book of Abraham and how that came about, and the church has now admitted that it's not a translation from the papyri. Yeah. And so that has led more people out of Mormonism probably than any of these, uh, these, Some of these, these other topics. topics. Yeah, but one of the things you do find when you read these, as you probably have read them, um, that they're not a full disclosure of the truth. Uh, Here again, just kind of almost lawyerese, isn't yeah, it? They're trying to play talk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're not even written by the church leaders. It was written by an independent people who... Scholars or yes, something? Yeah. Yeah, who wrote and then they were edited by the, by the religion department at BYU and then released to the public. But, well, well, I've asked a lot of people whether they have... Do you know about the essays? Because you have to know that. So many of they don't even know no. about them, so you don't even have to ask if you've read yeah. them or not. It's not helpful to the members to read them. I mean, it's not going to help their testimonies really, but they're going to find out some of the truth about their yeah. history and their doctrine. Do you think they'll it. ever be quoted in general conference by a? You know, they're authority? put in. You know, those those come follow me manuals. They're, yeah. Okay, as part Are of they the addition. there. As part of the additional resource uh, information. Oh. They say go to the gospel topic essays to. Mm -hmm read more about them. So they're, they're, they're trying to be, you know, here it is if you want to go look at it and, you know. Uh, just assuming though that most people You would think they would won't. just come out in general conference and give a talk about it, but. Yeah, have somebody gonna... actually talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, we're actually getting close again almost. This is fun. Uh, maybe I'll finish up with this one today, um, okay. or this, this one, but the Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls and manuscripts. I was suspect of the Bible, like uh, article, article of Faith number 8 says, that we can only trust the Bible as far as it's translated correctly. And, that the, and, and I took the lines out of the Book of Mormon that the Catholic Church, or the great and abominable uh -huh. church at least, had uh, taken all the plain and precious parts out of the, out of the Bible. 
And so when the Dead Sea, I mean, it, it's just interesting how God in 1947 throws out the beginnings of this Dead Sea Scroll experience. And <laughs> nobody, I mean, the church must have been thrilled to have those. They were. To, to, to yeah. justify, first of all, Joseph Smith's translation yeah, of the Bible. Certain, yeah, that was going to support. And then, oops, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, doesn't, that, that doesn't match up with Joseph no. Smith. But guess what? It, it does match up with the Bible, even mostly the King James Version, too, that the church uses. Yeah. And the, the fact that the church was, um, or that the, the Catholic Church, or the Great and Abominable, whatever the church is that that is, uh, really didn't change any of those, the words that are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They, they support the whole entire um, sure. Old Testament, pretty yeah. much. Um, any yeah, thoughts it, on that? When you well, I just think that the, um, the Bible has been preserved. God had, it was God's word, and he had a hand in doing that. It was a miraculous uh, yeah. project that over the centuries, it all has been preserved so well, and now they continue to find artifacts and uh, fragments that make the translation even mu that much better. So it's really a, an amazing and book. When, and when you think about the focus, even of the Old Testament, all the symbolism and the Abraham sacrifice and David, and all these things that point to Jesus yeah. and the temple and and the, the, the uh, sacrifice of animals and all that. When you think, when you understand a biblical concept of Jesus and who he was and what he did for us, then the whole thing makes sense. As a Mormon, it doesn't because it doesn't have all these other things that Joseph Smith added. That's true. Or that the church has added, but the gospel is there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's important that, I mean, Joseph Smith, if he's, the damage I think he did I mean, I'm, is that he discounted the book, of, the, the the Bible, yeah. and uh, and put questions in people's mind as to whether or not they can trust the Bible, and my challenge is to any LDS member is to tell me what what is missing from the Bible, what's been changed or what's been taken out, yeah. because nobody yet has been able to sh tell me. Yeah. Uh, what, so what are the plain and precious? You can make accusations, but if you can't back it up with yeah. evidence, then. And really... one last thing, and we're down to the last minute. You bet. Is the um, quotes of the early fathers, yes. who quoted the Old Testament or the New Testament, right. the, pro, the 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 Gospels and the Apostle Paul and some of those things that were early on. Yeah. And. Um, I didn't realize there were so many manuscripts like that. The most well-documented or supported yeah. volume. Um, Over 20,000. All kinds of manuscripts. Yes. And they talk, they quoted from the, from the New Testament. So anyway, it's just, uh, yeah. I think that is a great disservice that Joseph Smith did was to even put doubt there. Have you, you ever know, read John 1-1 one, one well, in the, my, in the jo Joseph Smith translation? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a, yeah. It's crazy yeah, how anyway. he changed yeah. the wording. But that, speaking of John 1, that was what really started to convict me of who Jesus was when I started to read the first chapter of John as a Mormon. And I started reading that, and I thought, oh my gosh, this Jesus of the Bible is not the Jesus that I know in Mormonism. Not my elder brother. No. No. He's, he's in God incarnate, it says right there. He's God and he came and yes. dwelt in the flesh. Yeah. And so that was big. I love the Well thanks Danny. Thank we'll you. do one more. Okay. See if we can get finished up. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.